This episode of Kind of Funny Games Cast is brought to you by Movement Watches. Movement Watches was founded on the belief that style shouldn't break the bank. The watchmaker's goal is to change the way consumers think about fashion by offering high-quality, minimalist products at revolutionary prices. With over 500,000 watches sold to customers in 160-plus countries around the world, Movement Watches has solidified itself as the world's fastest-growing watch company. Greg Miller has his sexy one with the red hands and the black face. Ooh, baby. It looks nice. Movement watches start at just $95. At a department store, you're looking at $400 to $500. Movement figured out that by selling online, they were able to cut out the middleman and retail markup, providing the best possible price. We're talking about classic design, quality construction, and styled minimalism. You know I'm a fan of that. You can get 15% off today with free shipping, free returns, by going to movementwatches.com slash kinda. That's M-V-M-T watches.com slash kinda. Okay? Join the movement. Anyways, you can leave your questions on kindofony.com slash gamescast topic, just like my dude, Andrew Taylor did. You want to know what Andrew Taylor had to say, Greg? Yeah, I do. What are some of the smaller indie games that we know of that you're excited for? Any Vita exclusives? Greg, how does Patapon make you feel? Patapon makes me feel amazing. Mm. I can't wait to get Patapon. Can't wait for there to be a release date. Can't wait to platinum it. Can't wait to play it nonstop for the rest of my life. Smaller games you're looking forward to. I mean, the big one, the smaller one that I think you'll agree with is Emily is Away. Right, well, that's two. on my list. Damn it, you stole it from me. I thought it's I was Emily is Away too, right? Emily is Away too. Yeah, T-O-R. early 2017. Ooh, come yeah. on, you fucking kidding me? Can't another wait for that another I am adventure. Woo-wee. Get on the instant messenger. See what's up. I'm stoked about that. For those of you that don't know, what Emily away is away is. Uh, I mean, it's a. A game we did a let's play for it's a simulation it's a step back in time where you're using AOL instant messenger to talk to this girl Emily and so she says stuff and then you have to pick your response and it you it, it's one two or three but you have to still type it out what it would be or whatever like you start typing and then it just makes it makes it feel like you're really doing it and me and Tim started the let's play totally joking it was like a 45 minute game too you want to replay it for different endings different you know how does she respond to this or that or the other thing and but it's just sitting there talking you pick your buddy icon but to hear the buddy list and have the door open, the door close, and the I, I am noise, and the away messages, and the little quotes, and your thing. It was like it started as a joke, and then it got super serious. Of like, we felt like we were back. I mean, by the end of it, we were so so invested. Go watch that. Let's play. My, my yeah. favorite thing about it is that in addition to having the buddy icons and having your profile and being able to look at your buddy list and read other people's profiles yeah. and get kind of the story of the world, uh, it takes place over a couple of years, and those years being from like 2001 to 2006. Yeah, uh, when you and your character goes from like high school and then into College. Yeah, it's like your first, your final, your senior year or whatever, and then it's your freshman year of college and so on and forth. So it's yeah. awesome. And then your, so your buddy icons, they change every year based on like what, what bands what are, bands are yeah. out. So it's like uh, in like 2005, it's like Eminem's Encore. That yeah. you I'm like, this is fucking awesome. It was fucking rad. It was amazing. So yeah. I can't wait to see what the second one is about. Similar yeah. to it, they say, you know, not a different Emily. Supposedly, different yeah, story. it's going to be different Emily, which yeah. I hope so there's better about. endings or different endings. Yeah, I was the Because even remember like our whole thing point. was like, we did, like, ah, fuck, what if we did this? And you, we went and like find out, you're like, oh. Same thing, it but whatever. in the same place. Whatever, but anyway, whatever. great experience. And it, also, check out the Let's Play we did, because it is one of my favorite videos I think we've ever made. Just because we went from being so like, oh, this is cool, to just being enthralled by it. What would you call? The two games that come to mind from an independent uh, lens is uh, the first one's Cosmic Star Heroine, uh, which I've been talking about for a long time. Uh, it was supposed to come out last summer, uh, and then pushed to the fall, I think, and I don't know what the, what the nature of it is now. It's by, by a small studio called Z-Boyd. Um, it is a Japanese. It is a Western role playing game, but in the Japanese style, it, it uh, seems to take a lot from Chrono Trigger. It also seems to take a lot from Fantasy Star, uh, the old Genesis uh, Master System Fantasy Star games. I feel like uh, that game looks phenomenal. I can't wait to play it. Everything stops when that game comes into my hands. I, I really, I played it for the first time on PSX in 2014 before we left IGN, and I was completely enamored with it. I, I just thought it was uh, it was brilliant, um, and I really, really am looking forward to it. And I wish they would just finish it. But take your time if. If that's what you need, and obviously it is. The other game that comes to mind is uh, our friend Dan Edelman's represented game, Chasm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, Chasm is a um, uh, procedurally generated Metroidvania, uh, and it just looks fantastic. And I'm really, really, really super stoked about it. Um, and I actually just talked to Dan today about about that and other games. So um, really, really excited about that. There are a lot of independent games that are coming out, but yeah. those are the two that I think are, are are most exciting on my list right now. And uh, again, we I use that term lightly because you know they have publisher relationships and stuff. Obviously. Of course. Uh, Night in the Woods is coming up soon. That's February 21st, I think, is the release. What's that? 
uh, side scrolling move around. It's an exploration game. It's described to me when I when I, they've tried to get us to go play it a bunch of times when they come through for GC or a PSX or whatever. But you're playing as like a, a cat, but he's like a human. You know what I mean? And like going through, like it's like you know cartoony characters, or whatever. Okay. Like it's just characters look like that. And uh, but it's like described as like Gone Home as you're trying to piece together the story as you go. Um, I don't know if it's 2017. I haven't heard an update. But Apartment, that game we did another Let's Play for about all the different stories happening in that apartment building. I would hope that's this year. I talked to. Um, Robin, I believe, right? The developer at PAX, the last PAX, so PAX Prime up there mm-hmm. or whatever. And it's one of those things where they all have real jobs. They're doing it their off time. And the, I'm looking forward to that game a lot. And then there was another one that's now going to sk- slip away that I had for a second. It's gone. I'll come back to you with it when I, if I remember it. Yeah, the two other ones for me that are kind of not, they're in that weird indie or the not indie section. Go for it. Y2K, a post uh, modern RPG. I've been waiting for that one for fucking ever, and it should be this year. Uh, our Cuphead. And the new Shovel Knight DLC. This one. So there was Spectre Knight. No, no Spectre Knight's the one coming up. Mm. I'm stoked about that. Spectre Knight, my favorite. Plague Knight was the first one. Yeah. Yeah. I, Knight, uh, I didn't really like uh, that. Uh, might be going to see them soon. So we'll have more information on that. Uh, yeah, it looks awesome. Um, I, I didn't like the Plague Knight DLC at all. It just felt off to me. Uh, I remember when we played it, we tried to do a, <clears throat> a Let's Play of it a way long time ago. And uh, it just, just doesn't feel right, which is a shame because Shovel Knight's so fucking good. Uh, I wish that they would kind of just move on. But uh, my assumption is that they have, and and we'll find out more about that soon. But well, it sounds like they're doing a lot more for this too. Yeah, they are. Kings but, Knight DLC, and but they've they've scaled, and and uh, I don't think that they're going to marinate forever on on the original Shovel Knight. They, I think their original their original goal was to do a 16 bit and then a 64 bit one, and yeah. so we'll see, and I we'll see so. what, what God, happens. That's awesome. Is Tacoma this, this year? So bad. I think it so. should be right. It feels like it's not really an appropriate time. Sure, that's that's where it always gets weird, right? All right, next question from Ken Landelfeld. How will the illustrious Konami celebrate Metal Gear's 30th anniversary? Put do anniversaries matter anymore? They do sometimes. They don't other times. I mean, um, you know, a lot of people have a lot of problems with the way Capcom's been treating Mega Man, which uh, I oh, think Are you is, one of those people? I am, but okay. it's its 30th anniversary, and it starts a celebration of the 30th anniversary. It was similar to the 25th anniversary of Mega Man when they released, like, Street Fighter Cross... Mega Man or whatever it was, which was basically just a game someone made, and then someone in Capcom was like, oh shit, Mega Man's birthday is coming up, and then they just basically were like, we won't we won't ask you to shut this game down, just give, let's, let's put it out together. And then with this, the 30th anniversary, because obviously Rock Man was released in 87, um, was uh, these 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 iOS and Android ports of the, of the six, um, the two trilogies basically from NES, and they're apparently fucking awful. So, um, they matter, it's just, it's just, it's just not, it's just oh not, uh, it matters to fans, and, and fans expect more. And then it seems like a lot of people, once again, are asleep at the switch. And Konami, I mean, fuck Konami, who cares what they do? They, 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 they're not the company that everyone thinks that they're going to turn back into. And I don't know that they're ever going to be that company again. They don't care. They don't care about Castlevania. They don't care about Contra. They don't care about Metal Gear. Oh, they care about Metal Gear. They're they care about, about four Metal player Gear co-op thing. You run around shooting shit. It's ridiculous. So that's probably what they'll do. It's just Metal Gear Survive. There's all these rumors of the Snake Eater remake. I'm like. <laughs> You guys fucking stupid? That's all being pulled from that Pachinko, Pachinko machine, machine where they have like the Super HD, you know, the bo- oh, it was up earlier, boss, you know, confronting. Yeah, the boss. but real talk, what the fuck's the story of that? Why does it look so good? Why did they put that much work into these renders? The Pachinko machine makes so much money for them. That's just so weird. I, I don't understand why those visuals at a Pachinko machine are going thing. hand in hand. Yeah, like, because that game, that looks fucking awesome. Sure. I mean, think I mean, uh, people who want to play those in Japan know the source material. They love the source material. They want to see it look awesome. Yeah, man. I don't know. Blows my damn mind. I'll blow your head. Blow it good. <laughs> blow that shit good. Outlaw Reaver says, "Hey guys, want to know your thoughts on GameStop's publishing label Game Trust signed developers? Here's the breakdown: Insomniac Games, who did Song of the Deep, Frozen Bite." who did the Trine series, Ready at Dawn, who did the Order 1886, and Tequila Works, who did Deadlight and now Rhyme. Now, quick side note. I don't appreciate this question. This is an old Game Scoop Podcast Beyond thing, where this is a double dipper. This was on the list for possible PS I Love You questions mm. this week. Didn't make the cut, so it doesn't matter. But I had it, it on. It, ma- it was on the docket, though. Mm. In a different in a universe where Colin didn't poop forever, Got we it. read that question. Got it. Yeah. What's your answer? I mean, I love Song of the Deep. I think it, I think they're doing. It's an interesting thing. It's a cool idea. GameStop, as we talk uh, about the digital future, needs to figure out what the fuck the next ten years looks like for them. And so the idea of like, 
all right, cool. We have all this money. We have a distribution arm. This is an all right solution. Why not go through and let's do some, let's do games. You, if you want physically, you get them exclusively here. Uh, like, and that's the whole thing with song of the deep, right? Where again, cart in front of the horse. Uh, like we, I, we always talk about where, Hey, there's this new IP out. So now here's a toy and a t-shirt and this and that. Da, da, da. It, sometimes it, most of the time probably blows up in people's face. But for song of the deep, a game that I really appreciated when I finished that, I was like, fuck yeah, I do want a Marin, you know, Funko Pop for my desk. And like, mm-hmm. they had shirts and they had all this different stuff. That only happens because GameStop's so in bed with them and has that money and has that that arm to be like, cool, there's a whole bunch of cool shit for these cool games we're putting out over here. And that, that's what's crazy about GameStop is I walked into one for the first time in a, in a, in a while uh, over the break and it's a, it's a hot topic now. Yeah. It's like they have more t-shirts and toys and Funko Pops and backpacks and cups and mugs and all this shit than they have games. It's crazy. Yeah. But I get it though. Like good for them trying to adapt. You got it. Right. right? And that's the whole thing. You can't knock them. They're trying, they're out there hustling. They're doing something different. They're doing something cool. You know, no one can say that song of the deep, all the other games on the list wouldn't exist without this, but it is all right, cool. Here's money. Go make this game that it maybe isn't for PlayStation or wouldn't be on Microsoft's radar. It's a cool idea and it's something different and more power to them. Anything to add, Cole? No, I think GameStop's just trying to experiment with uh, known developers by making small, cheap games and seeing what happens. I don't know that they're going to get the outcome that they want to get uh, from a commercial standpoint until they in- and choose to invest a lot of money into a game. And um, I can't imagine that Song for the Deep was made for any more than a few million dollars. Sure. So, um, you figure, though, this has got to be the business play, though, right? <clears throat> let's start yeah. small. Let's do small games. Let's prove. It's this team, I'm, I assume, of Game Trust people at GameStop who are like, all right, let's do this. We make things. We can show the revenue model. We can show how we made this game, this IP a thing, and then we made this money on merchant. So let's, you know, now let's go and try to make a triple A. Yeah, know, I suppose. A I, I, I mean, that's clearly the idea, I think, but I, I don't know that they would have been misguided in just saying, like, let's make one big game um, with a big developer. And I understand that there, it seems almost like, in a way, with the studios that they have relationships with, that, that it's like a tryout. Yeah. Um, Ready at Dawn is busy with a lot of things, apparently with VR games. I, I wouldn't be surprised if they're working with Sony again. Uh, obviously, Insomniac's busy with a, a ton of shit. Tequila works. Who knows what the fuck they're doing? But the uh, it seems like it's like a little trial kind of situation, but I don't know that they're going to get the outcome until they choose to invest the money. You spend money to make money. And so um, but I think they, like if you're if you're investing like Deformers, for instance, which is an interesting game, it's not going to sell anything. Yeah. And like so like what is your expect? Like Deformers isn't just not going to sell. It's not going to sell. No one's going to care. And I can just tell you that now. I can tell you that when we played the GameStop Expo, I can tell you that fucking six months before that. Um, and so it's like, well, why then? I think, I think and, you and I nailed really, it. I, I think really it's get... experience. I think they're doing something they've never done before. This reminds me of when I started the YouTube channel, the YouTube channel that would become this, right? Like Colin, uh, or ask Colin, what do we call it? Conversation no, with Colin, Colin shows and Oreo oration were not the shows I wanted to do. I had an idea for the show I fucking wanted to do, but I didn't know how to edit. I didn't know how to publish. I didn't know anything. So it was like, well, fuck, I'll do these shows that. I don't care as much about or there's not as much put into in terms of something going wrong or right. I think that's it. Right now you do this. I don't know if it's so much about how much money you make as much as like, well, let's learn the ins and outs of it and let's figure out what does work and doesn't work so that when we do take $10 million and drop it on something, it can we know a little bit of what we're getting into. Tastings says, Tastings. hey guys. I was on the Kind of Funny Facebook group last month whining about never having a question read on any of the shows. Then, like a one-winged angel from heaven, Tim replied and told me to ask a question in 2017. He'd read it on the games cast. I'm here, motherfucker. You should have just told him, like ask a, a good question. Angel. That's not good. That's not a good thing. A one-winged Sephiroth's angel. cool. I'll it's take cool, it. but he's going to kill you. Like a badass. That's what I do. I kill people. Right, Kevin? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Why don't the big three console companies steal from each other more often? I started thinking about this when I was playing Nino Kuni Wrath of the White Witch. It was basically the Pokemon game I always wanted. It was on a PlayStation home console. Why don't they steal Zelda, Mario Kart, or 3D Mario games from Nintendo? Steal Gears of War and Halo from Xbox. Steal The Last of Us, Infamous, and Resogun from Sony. Thanks for reading my question. You guys are kind of awesome. They do. They steal from each other all the time. I mean, I think well, some of those examples, like Mario Kart, like everyone's done a, a kart racer. Yeah, yeah Mod Nation sort. and Little Big Planet Karting were both yeah. attempts to do that. Uh, PlayStation All Stars was right away. stealing yeah. Smash Brothers. Yeah. Uh, you know, Killzone was uh, its own response to Halo. Uh, directly, um, they want Sony wanted their own big shooter. I think they were way behind on that particular genre. I don't think they understood how that that genre was migrating the console. Um, so these things happen constantly. The open world games, uh, I think Infamous is a response to Crackdown. I think that like there there are there are things that are 
that are uh, happening in that respect. I, I, I already see that happening. And then and then third parties do that too. 3D Dot Heroes is a complete rebel. I was going to say, yeah, third parties um, getting in there and filling mm-hmm. a lot of gaps too, mm-hmm. where it's like, well, why does Sony need to go worry? Well, I guess they're making an open world <laughs> game, but yeah. you know what I mean? Like, all right, there's a million of them out there. I, actually, I do think it's interesting though, because there's certain games that I, I'm a little shocked we, we're not seeing more direct uh, competition to, like Uncharted. Tomb Raider and Microsoft's partnership for Rise of the Tomb Raider is, I guess, kind of a step in that direction. But it is a little shocking that there's not a game of that kind of um, movie experience quality that Microsoft tries to do with uh, any of their like main flagship titles mm-hmm. instead of doing things like Scalebound or whatever. Sure. Cost money. I mean, that's the thing is that, it, uh, you know, it can't be understated how much Uncharted 4 and The Last of Us 2 are like are going to and are costing Sony. I mean, these are expensive games and you have to and you have to have no disrespect to any of the other studios that are working on a lot of these games. Microsoft has no studio that's anywhere near Naughty Dog's talent. You, you also need a You also need a studio that can be able to do that. If Sony asks any of their other studios to make a game like The Last of Us, they wouldn't be able to do it. You know, it's just not it's not possible and I you think know, that's, that's going further going down the, the train of thought I was having where like why don't more people copy Mario is a question I often ask myself it's like why doesn't PlayStation have a game that, that's like Mario Ratchet and Clank I'd say is the closest thing in terms of being a quality um, platformer but it's not really a platformer it's you know it's also kind of a third person shooter in a lot of ways and it's it's not Mario you know mm-hmm. uh, but I think the, the reason is like Mario's Mario and Mario's at such a high level that you can't compete with that and even if you could compete from it from a quality perspective you still don't have that ne- recognition and nobody's buying those type of games on that level so it's not even worth really investing there yeah I agree I think that like there's certain uh, ecosystems that cultivate certain amounts of talent or certain expectations and there's just no expectation for that on Sony I think that that's why the original Killzone was not a good game because um, they were like, well, we need a shooter, and it's like, well, but it's not. It's you don't need a shooter; you need a good shooter, you know. And and I think that's what they ended up getting with Resistance, which I think was their attempt to do that again, but um, which I think was way closer to Halo and in, in, in a lot of ways genetically. But yeah, I, I agree with you. Like we had, you know, Little Big Planet, for instance, was uh, in a way, in its own way. I, I don't, I don't like Little Big Planet at all. But uh, Little Big Planet, in its own way, was a harbinger of things to come with things like Mario Maker. It's just that, like, we didn't have because it was like, you know, a side scroll. You make your own stage. It's a little weird, a little share and. You, have a good time, or whatever, but like it's just that's not what people play PlayStation for. If that was on Nintendo a long time ago and they had their own IP and stuff like that, it would have been bigger sooner. It's just I think that there are expectations that are different. But I, you know, great artists steal, and these people are stealing from each other all the time, and there's no shame in that. <clears throat> I've said I've said over and over us. again that mo- for the most part, a shooter should feel like Call of Duty. You should just take that. It's okay. Make your own story and your own world and your own art, but it should feel like Call of Duty. Or and Halo. every platform should feel it like should Mario. Play like Halo. Real Radic 13 says, is it possible that Crystal Dynamics is now moving on from Tomb Raider and working on a new legacy of Kane? Oh. Back in November 2015, Crystal Dynamics senior designer Michael Brinker said that there's a 50-50 chance of a new game in the series developed by them. He goes on to say that there are in-house developers in the studio who really want it to happen, and also with the leaked Shadow of the Tomb Raider rumored to be developed by Square Enix Montreal, and the main writer of the Tomb Raider reboot series leaving the franchise, does this all point to Crystal Dynamics developing a new legacy of Kane? Thanks points to them making guys. something else. I don't know that it necessarily points to them making a legacy Kane. I don't think that would be a good idea. Yeah, either. it seems like if the time has passed for that. I was yeah. going to say, I feel like you, that's a step backwards. It's similar when we talk about Jack and Daxter, when we're talking about Naughty Dog. Like, no, go make something else. Do something else. Especially take all the lessons you've learned from Tomb Raider. Take some Eastern or, um, Eastern IP. Like, th- that's the thing that Square Enix is is just refusing to do, which is just to, like, they they have a global network of studios that can borrow from each other pretty openly and I'd like to see someone like Crystal make a fucking Final Fantasy spinoff or make like do so, like we'll see what you can do with some of these IP that they own if I were if I were associated in any way with Square Enix I'd go over there and I'd be like what kind of obscure ass IP can we fucking dig up you know and try to do something with um because they have a ton of them you know could and so that's what I would that's what I would hope some of these studios are working on so I don't think it I think it indicates I think that the uh, Square Enix Montreal rumor of the Tomb Raider thing which I think is obviously real um indicates that Crystal Dynamics is just going to make something else. But I don't know that it's necessarily Legacy of Kane. I don't think that would be a good idea for them to do. Not a shitting on Legacy of Kane, it's just that they want to sell games. And not for nothing, Tomb Raider games did not take off. Idos Montreal. I'm sorry, Idos Montreal. Just keeping you honest. Uh, you know, Rise of the Tomb Raider, I think, was a disappointment for them. And not from a quality standpoint, because it's fucking great. But I don't think it sold very well on Xbox One. I don't think it sold very well on PS4. And I think that they have to make something big. You know, I mean, well, like, what sucks the most about Tomb Raider and Rise of the Tomb Raider is that those games would have been big if they were all at once. Let's release it on all the platforms at once. But this exclusivity deal that I understand taking because it's money in your pocket, and especially for the first one, you would think that it was going to go the other way. 
man, did that fuck this franchise. It's so great. It's such a fucking great... God, those games, 1 and 2, are so fucking good. And they are criminally underplayed. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Ben, the Kind of Funny Games cast. Thank you all for joining us. We will see you next week. And I'm sure we'll be talking on Nintendo Switch because at the time this was recorded, Switch. we haven't seen the presentation yet. It happens tomorrow. I'm very excited. But by the time people this will last see time this... I'm talk to you in a pre- Switch world. And by the time people see this, you will have played the Switch will and Kevin it. will be dead of pizza overdose. So much pizza. <laughs> Till next time, I love you. I didn't like that. That was... <laughs>